Hi, thanks for joining us at the Automotive Linux Summit 2021. Um, we're here to, to talk today about how to, to build out sustainable platforms um, and in particular how we can drive a wider adoption of, of testing, QA and CI throughout upstream open source projects um, so we can really drive the adoption of open source and get what vendors actually distribute to users um, to be much, much closer um, to the actual projects themselves. Um, so my name's Daniel Stone. I'm the graphics lead at Calabra, um, covering projects such as Mesa, Wayland, uh, Western, and the free desktop.org ecosystem. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Guillaume Tucker and I also work at Colabra. I've been leading the Kernel CI project um, in general and also I've been working on it as part of Colabra for the past uh, three, four years. I'm currently also chair of the, um, the advisory board for the Linux Foundation project. So today we're going to cover a few areas. Um, in particular, we're going to, to start with the existing ecosystem that we have with upstream um, open source projects, which projects are interesting to us, um, the challenges uh, we've faced as we've uh, driven heavily the adoption of these more rigorous testing and CI and, and QA procedures throughout them, um, the results of those efforts as well, um, you know, the testing frameworks we've been able to build out in each project, um, the results we've had from those and, you know, what we've learned along the way, really, in terms of things like process, um, adoption, socializing, um, and then finally, how we can build out from the slightly more siloed testing frameworks that we have at the moment to having something a little bit more, more coherent um, and shared between all the different projects. The main challenge we have is, is the sort of disconnect between the two different models. In a traditional product development model, um, the, the products are really worked on in almost a waterfall fashion where they're fully tested at each step along the way. Um, everyone has a clear idea of what the goals and the metrics and the acceptance criteria are, and there are various sort of gating processes along that. Um, if you compare to traditional open source projects, it's been very much a, a commons project with not necessarily a shared vision or a shared set of priorities or even the ability to, to break those kind of deadlocks um, and the disagreements and try and enforce uh, some kind of priorities. So testing of upstream work often fell into a bit of a gap where it wasn't really native to the projects themselves and the users didn't necessarily see the need for upstream testing because they already had all of their own testing on uh, downstream branches and, and what they shipped and their own QA departments um, that they would almost take over. but with all of the cost falling on the vendor and none of the benefit being delivered to all of the other users of the upstream projects. But we do believe it's possible to, to bridge this gap. So yeah, today we'll, we'll be talking about a lot of the work we've done throughout various projects to, to bring this um, more native testing and CI and just take it into the process for um, all of these projects. So the projects we, we've been working with include the Linux kernel itself, um, Mesa, which is the de facto standard for open source um, graphics drivers and acceleration, Wayland and Western, um, the again de facto standard window and display system under Linux, and GStreamer for, for multimedia support as well. So starting with a Linux kernel, uh, we'll go through how the kernel development uh, workflow typically works. So first of all, uh, you have developers sending 
patches via mailing lists, then maintainers apply patches after some review uh, on their own branches, on their own Git trees. And then they, um, some of them might have um, a, a branch that they share uh, to, be, to be tested with Linux Next uh, or with various CI systems. Um, and eventually the maintainer branch will get merged into um, into another maintainer branch until it gets merged uh, into Linux Torvalds tree, which can take up to three months. There's a merge window every three months uh, for merging all the new changes. Um, <coughs> so um, in all the, in the workflow I just explained, I didn't mention testing anywhere. So that depends on how it depends on how um, each subsystem actually uh, functions. Some subsystems will do all their um, testing directly when people submit uh, some changes. Um, other subsystems rely on the maintainers to run their own tests, so they would have their own manual workflows or maybe some automated workflows. Um, but none of that is really systemic. So you have a collection of uh, test systems available um, that will test a mainline kernel and a variety of, uh, of uh, Git branches uh, available. So one of them is kernel CI, uh, which has now become a project of uh, the Linux Foundation, as it has kind of been chosen as the, the main project for testing the upstream Linux kernel. Um, so it's focusing on what we call post-merge testing, so it's after a patch has been applied to a branch. So it's monitoring a, a number of Git branches, and as soon as it detects a new rev revision, it will uh, test it, build it, and send some reports. Um, we, we can see that gradually more and more subsystems and uh, maintainers are starting to engage with kernel CI and rely on the results that it's producing. Um, on this slide, you can see a diagram, like a, a big picture diagram of how uh, currently uh, uh, test-driven kernel development uh, kind of looks like. So you have um, a crowd of people first, as like the ecosystem, you have well different types of developers, you have uh, OEMs, you have also uh, maintainers. Um, so they all contribute to the kernel uh, source code itself via Git branches. They also contribute to some tests, uh, so LTP, KSELF, test KUnit are the main um, examples for upstream-oriented uh, test suites. Uh, and then um, kernel CI will build some kernels and also build the test suites and then run the tests against the kernels and share the results and then report the results via emails or a web dashboard um, to the developers and that's how the, the loop is closed. Um, to understand um, a bit better what the developers actually need in, in order for kernel CI to be more widely used, we've, uh, we've run a, a survey in 2020, uh, we called it the community survey. There's a blog post available on kernelci.org website if you want to read the whole report. But here there's a small summary of the main takeaways from that survey. Um, so we need to um, ideally, we would need to test patches before they get applied, so like pre-merge, if you want to call it like this, um, because then you get really uh, short um, feedback cir uh, circuit. So when someone sends someone uh, some patch on a mailing list, you could get a um, reply really quickly whether it's breaking anything or not. Um, that's really important, um, as you know, based on the results from the survey. Um, and then for things that are run post-merge, uh, it seems like what makes a lot more sense is to run uh, really long tests that maintainers don't have the time to run, uh, or you know, things that are difficult to run by hand. Uh, especially, as, say, on, on stable kernels, when there's normally like one release per week, uh, it would be okay to have like tests that take 24 hours, for example. Um, and then the third thing is uh, improving the web dashboard. So we have currently one dashboard on kernelci.org. Uh, it's been there for several years and um, it's showing the results, but there's many things that could be done to really improve it so that more users would be using it. And um, we're collecting user stories. Well, we're kind of collecting feedback, ideas and suggestions from you know, anyone who would want to have, you know, what would be your ideal web dashboard? And we're starting to derive from that a set of requirements to start really designing um, a better dashboard. Uh, this is driven by the Linux Foundation Kernel CI project at the moment.
we're hoping to see some concrete results in 2022. Um, so kernel CI runs a number of, well, it builds some kernels and then runs some uh, tests, uh, mostly functional tests. Um, initially, it was doing only boot testing to, very, to check whether a platform would boot at all. Um, now we've started running more and more functional tests, things like IGT to test well, DRM KMS as well as some GPUs as well now, um, and classic test suites like uh, Linux Test Project LTP, um, and KSELF test and KUnit, which come with the kernel source tree itself. So we're running about 15% of what LTP provides and KCL test provides. Um, we're not really running KUnit yet, uh, but that's coming soon. And we've, we've been working with the KUnit maintainers to get this um, enabled in kernel CI. So that's what, what we call the native tests. They are all orchestrated by kernel CI itself. Now, in addition to these tests, we can look at kernel CI from a functionality point of view. So what does it do? So first it monitors a number of trees. There's about 100 Git branches that are monitored from individual uh, maintainers, you know, subsystems, architecture subsystems, and then you have bigger, uh, well, mainline and Linux next, that are like integration branches, and stable, all the stable and long-term stable branches, as well as uh, some branches for uh, member companies of the project like uh, CIP, and, and uh, we're starting to look at Chrome OS kernels as well. Um, and one really interesting feature of kernel CI is the ability to track regressions when a test has been passing in previous revisions of a kernel and one day it starts failing for an individual specific test case as soon as it starts failing is detected as a regression and uh, typically automatically there will be um, a bisection started for that which will um, try to find the commit between the last good revision and the first bad revision to understand which commit actually caused the problem. And this is uh, particularly useful on uh, Linux Next where you have a lot of changes from one day to the next. Um, and thanks to this we're finding a lot of a lot of issues and reporting we can report the issues directly to the developers because if you know who you know if you know the author of the commit you can send uh, the message to the author and related maintainers and people around the um, uh, maintainers related to the code that was changed by the, by the patch itself. Uh, then another big aspect of kernel CI which is a bit more recent is KCIDB. So this is only a database that's meant to collect results from any CI system that's running kernel tests. So the native tests, like I, I explained in the previous slide, um, the native native tests are collected there, but we're also collecting results from other test systems. Um, and if you have your own test system, you can also, uh, you know, any, anybody can submit test results there. So the idea is to avoid, uh, to reduce duplication. And in principle, a new web dashboard will be showing this information, which is like a superset of what you see right now on kernelci.org. By opposition to the native test, you have like the non-kernel CI tests, so things that are run outside of kernel CI, the tests that are not orchestrated directly by kernel CI, such as um, Zero Day um, and Syscaller, uh, Fuzzing Bot, uh, and Red Hat's CKI, and uh, uh, several tools from Linaro as well. There's um, uh, Linaro Kernel Functional Tests, LKFT, and Tux Suite, which is more like a service. Everybody could subscribe to it to um, build kernels and start, uh, they also start to support running tests. And the result of all these, and a few more actually from ARM and Gen2 kernel CI and a few more, um, all these results are currently uh, being contributed to KCIDB. Actually, it's not all of syscaller, but some of, because that's a huge data set, but that is some of the syscaller results are being contributed to KCIDB. And it's that's growing. There's a, there's a weekly report on the kernel CI mailing list you can see to have the status of all the different contributors. Mace is kind of an interesting contrast to this, I think, because it is, while it's the de facto standard for, for open source GPU drivers um, on Linux, so we're talking OpenGL, OpenGL ES, Vulkan, everything you need for, for both games, accelerated desktops, you name it. Um, 
it's much more limited in scope than the kernel. So of the drivers we have, we have eight different hardware vendors, um, obviously all with their own, you know, uh, big generational or, or smaller generational bumps. Um, and then we also have um, layered and, and virtualized drivers and our, our software reference driver. Um, it's a much smaller development community in Mesa compared to the kernel. Um, and these teams are often not directly supported by the hardware vendor. Um, it runs the entire spectrum from the hardware vendor has teams of people directly working on Mesa and producing their driver as a first class output. Um, a bunch in the middle where the vendor will assist and support the development team, but the development is being done externally to the hardware vendor, right the way through to completely reverse engineered efforts where the vendor has no involvement at all. So one challenge we've had is really in bringing Mesa up from, from this kind of scrappy underdog where you're happy that it works to um, now where we have we've gone from you know one driver that's been conformant for the past few years um, up to uh, several drivers having gone through the official Kronos, Kronos uh, conformance testing. Um, and that's been something we've really needed to um, to back up with some some really extensive testing to make sure that we stay conformant. Um, you know, it's a really it's a really sort of hard won <laughs> battle, and and you, you know we don't want to be slipping back, and we also don't want to lose the development velocity that we've been able to have within Mesa. Um, and this can be quite difficult because as Mesa is relatively understaffed as a project compared to something like the kernel, um, the development community can tend to naturally silo a little bit. Um, even though people will work on the core of Mesa itself, of course, um, often their first target is a particular driver, and so their attention might be taken away by new hardware support or particular feature enablement or anything else which makes it difficult to have kind of a, a shared global overview of Mesa as a whole rather than, you know, your, your own uh, driver world. But luckily the one thing we have got um, that's been kind of a gift is Kronos has over the past few years made its conformance test suites publicly available. Um, so it's no longer just Kronos members who can run the official OpenGL and, and Vulkan conformance test suites, but they're available to the whole public and we're able to run those in, in public and distribute those now, which has really been a godsend. Um, so having that large amount of API coverage for the official conformance testing is great and running those, you know, that <laughs> that is the Kronos conformance process essentially is running those so you know where your driver stands if you're able to run those. In addition to that, we also have other test suites such as Piglet, which are kind of built from the reverse direction. So the conformance test suites have been built out by um, the API designers in parallel with the API being designed, and it's really focused on that. Whereas Piglet has just been incrementally built out by Mesa developers who will find a bug, realize that this could be particularly common or crippling or what have you, um, and then they'll put in a Piglet test for that to make sure that, that you don't regress. Um, and yeah, it's, it's possible to to do this with um, both actual hardware GPU drivers, um, but also it's possible, completely possible to just test the uh, reference software uh, driver we have, which has no hardware dependencies, but will just run on any CPU uh, with an LLVM backend. So doing that is a really nice sort of little uh, quiver in our bow, I suppose, to, um, be able to test the core of Mesa without needing dedicated hardware.
So the testing that we do have in Mesa, um, that covers several generations of all of AMD um, GPUs, the um, Mali GPUs, um, Broadcom's video core in the Raspberry Pi, all of the Intel GPUs, the Qualcomm Adreno that comes in their Snapdragon SoCs, and also the Verisilicon or Vivante uh, GPUs, which tend to come in processors like NXP. Um, and all of these have achieved, at least for some hardware generations or some API versions, official Kronos conformance. So we're, <laughs> again, we're very keen to, to make sure that we keep that and we don't regress backwards. Um, so we do quite extensive testing of those. Um, and the, the interesting contrast to the kernel, I think, is that we have a slightly more traditional for open source, I suppose, uh, pre-merge um, testing process, which is blocking. So when you submit a merge request and it's been reviewed and it's good to go, you assign it to a, a very cold and unfeeling bot who will go and <laughs> run a, a ton of um, tests and merge if they all succeed or tell you that something went wrong if any of them failed. So in order to support that process without everything collapsing, um, we, we want every merge pipeline to turn around in 15 to perhaps 20 minutes in Extremis. Um, but that has to cover running, um, you know, some generations of GPU will run over 300,000 individual tests for every MR um, between all the, the different various test suites. Um, so in order to do that, we, we had to build out a, a custom test runner framework. Um, but it's not just um, conformance tests that we run, but we also have traces from, from real life workloads, uh, captures from, from games or desktop clients or any of these where we take the um, GL and Vulkan command streams that they actually emit and we replay those um, and make sure that the output isn't changing um, or at least not not changing in a way that's seen as bad um, because OpenGL isn't pixel precise nor is Vulkan so you might have minor differences here and there um, and we have some tools which allow us to visualize the differences and see what the change is to to see if it's an acceptable change um, but yeah, all of this has to come within this relatively short time window. Um, and it's something that we have to get right, essentially, because, you know, rather than being a more advisory post-merge thing where code gets pushed out into the wild and then later on you get an email telling you that it broke something, um, if a test fails, then your merge request won't get merged. Um, it turns out that having flaky tests which block people's MRs is a pretty good way to um, get developers to tell you what they really feel about your test suite. And if we look at other projects, um, so Wayland and Weston were very early adopters of, of CI and um, having GitLab on freedesktop.org, um, but it for the longest time, they didn't get too far beyond build testing. Um, that's because one of the challenges we have in Wayland is the lack of an official universal conformance test suite. Um, so we have all of the tests on the server side inside Western that we've written for ourselves as we've developed it, but we don't have a similar target like we do with, um, with the Kronos APIs to be able to work towards and, and give us a yes, no answer. But even so, um, we're making use of, we actually test Western by starting up a new virtual machine um, with a clean known kernel and a, um, a virtual KMS driver, which just simulates a display controller. Um, and that gets us a lot of, of what we want um, because we're able to, to exercise a lot of different paths within our backends and make sure that they run 
about as well <laughs> as you can when you're you're working with a virtual driver rather than a real hardware driver. Um, but yeah, that that's where we are now for for Wayland and Western. The the back end testing testing things like rendering correctness and internal consistency. Um, but these are these are really home built tests. GStreamer, on the other hand, for multimedia, um, it's got a very well-established um, set of tests, which have almost always been there for both for its um, individual modules and also for end-to-end -end functional and integration testing. Um, so GST Validate is a suite which checks the modules and makes sure that they behave according to the GStreamer API contract. So in isolation, they look like they do what they should. And then Cerbero is a monster integration test suite, um, which does real end-to-end -end testing, um, put in through various workloads, again, that they've captured as they've gone on and uh, places where they found bugs. And then it's been added to the test suite to make sure that all of those corner cases um, work. And that's been a part of GStreamer Upstream for um, a good couple of years now. Again, concurrent with the, the move to GitLab on freedesktop.org. Um, but this is all happening um, as software-based testing. So it will run in containers and virtual machines on general purpose hosts. And we're not yet able to, um, to test how GStreamer behaves again with different um, hardware drivers, say for video for Linux or also for sound or um, any of those other inflection points. Now we've looked at um, how the kernel is being tested upstream and how uh, graphics and Wayland and GStreamer are being tested upstream. Um, we can start thinking about general concepts around um, what does it take to move an open source project to being really test driven? You can see, like we said at the beginning, um, pro commercial products or you know, f fully uh, integrated products are tested very thoroughly and they have control over their, their own universe. So there's no real barrier in terms of uh, people adopting it because it's a team working on it. So they all basically uh, adopt the, the workflow and the automated testing because that's just the way they do it and they have complete freedom over how they do this. For an open source project, you have contributors from many different um, uh, different horizons. Um, so they might all have different views about how, how to work. Also, you could have um, in a large project like Linux kernel, different parts of the, of the kernel will need different types of workflows. Some parts will be changing very quickly. Other parts will need to be really stable. So in the same way that open source code is really coming from like built by the ground up. So people contribute code and that's how it happens. Nobody's planning what's really gonna happen for the Linux kernel in the next few years or even the next few months. So it's in the same way that the changes are not really imposed. Of, of course, things are being designed, but nobody is like, nobody has a master plan and decides exactly how things are going to uh, unfold. So it's the same thing for testing it basically like people send code and um, request for comments on the mailing list about code changes. For testing, people can provide tools and, and suggest ways of doing things. And as people see that there's value in, in it and that it's something that they can adopt, then gradually uh, it will be adopted. Um, <clears throat> so basically this is what it, you can see this, um, uh, this happening already, like we've explained with kernel CI. Um, when some maintainers are starting to engage and look at the results. And maybe if kernel CI doesn't work, they have their own, or if it doesn't provide the results that they're looking for, they have their own um, manual test and they can still carry on. Like for stable kernels, typically kernel CI would be sending results for each stable kernel. Uh, so if the results are there and some problems were de detected by kernel CI, something will get done about it. Some people will try to fix them. But if for some reason kernel CI disappeared, uh, the stable kernel would still be released. It's just maybe some bugs will not be known and they'll be found later. That's currently how, how things work. 
Um, so maybe with time, it's a bit like a clutch mechanism. Maybe after a while, if we all spin at the same speed, then we can really engage, and then the test system will be working hand in hand with with the kernel. Uh, so this is all. This has already happened with MSCI and, and like. Um, um, like Daniel just explained, and of course sometimes you have a few sparkles in a, in a clutch system, so <laughs> it's not always easy to get it completely right <laughs> without any smoke um, coming out of it. But that's the, it's, it's really a, a price worth paying, basically, <laughs> because now you know that when a change comes in, it has to pass the tests, and that's really where you want to be. So like I've just explained, you have some, some tools available. So kernel CI is one of them for the kernel, but also this uh, zero day will be sending you emails um, and uh, Sysbot will be doing this as well, you know, fuzzing uh, syscalls uh, in the kernel to try, to try to find corner cases that nobody else has found before. Um, and so these are available. And of course they send uh, results by email. And if people don't like the emails that happen sometimes it's like, this report is not useful, people will reply and then things will get adjusted. Um, and um, yeah, for Miss, uh, Missa and Wayland and GStreamer, um, it, maybe it's a little bit easier to uh, to have things enforced. It's a bit like maybe like a subsystem in the kernel. If you have a small enough subsystem, uh, then it could operate in its own autonomy, <laughs> basically, and then decide to, to, to accept a, a test. Uh, or workflow, test-driven workflow. So that's kind of the step-by-step, the step-by-step uh, step step process that we have to go through. Yes, Daniel. I think that's a really good parallel. Um, I mean, I always thought the problem with the kernel wasn't that it had no master plan, but that it had like hundreds of them at any given time, right? <laughs> Whereas, yeah, just I think having that that smaller scope makes it much easier for us. So now we can see some numbers to have an idea of the dimension of uh, what is being done on the kernel side, well, at least from kernel CI point of view. Um, I didn't, I haven't put uh, stats about bisections, but every week there's one, two, or three um, bisections that lead to actual bug fixes, and that's growing. Um, so this is, you know, some metric that will be will be will be producing some stats at some point about that. Uh, you can already see the number of tests being run. So on Linux Next, which has the biggest coverage, uh, there's about tw uh, twelve thousand individual test cases run uh, every day because that's for every revision of uh, Linux Next, and that is growing as we keep adding new tests and new platforms, and we have also new test labs joining uh, that quickly increased um, the test coverage. Uh, on the second graph, you can see the KCIDB um, uh, number of builds. Uh, so this is all the builds from uh, from the native kernel CI um, builds. Um, but also here on, in this graph, you will see um, builds submitted by, um, by uh, LKFT and uh, all, all the other uh, submitters to KCIDB. So Tuck Suite and also CKI from Red Hat, uh, and also some bills from ARM. Uh, so this is, you know, it's gradually getting to the point where you see the actual number of people testing the, the upstream uh, Linux kernel. Uh, well, this is for all all the revisions, so we get about 20,000 builds. So for, and for each build you have maybe, maybe a thousand, two thousand tests. So um, we don't have all the tests yet in KCIDB, but that gives an idea of the, the size. Uh, and of course, maybe as we can see, we can start seeing the results put together. Maybe some duplication will be removed after a while. If we all keep building the same kernels, maybe we can reuse each other's kernels. We can, we'll see how that works, how, how that will work out over time. And similarly for Mesa, I mean, you can see some, um, a nice shiny graph there, um, with, I think a, a pretty interesting pattern in, in the number of tests versus, um, the number of commits or the number of merge requests that were made to Mesa. Um, it's definitely an iterative story, um, essentially of building out test coverage as wide as we can. And then, you know, for what that gives us, um, it turns out sometimes that's a bit overkill. Um, so one of the traditional patterns is that we'd introduce um, the first version of 
or the first iteration of testing for a particular hardware generation. Um, and we'd have a lot of those tests run um, just to, to shake it out and to get it completely stable and, and find out where all the issues are before we stepped it back. So, for example, if you submit a merge request which only modifies the AMD driver, then it's not going to run any of the tests on uh, Panfrost for the ARM Mali or the Fredrino driver for Qualcomm um, because we know that there's going to be no impact. Whereas if you um, if you submit a job which touches core code or submit a merge request which touches core code, you can see up to 155 jobs um, per merge request just uh, just touching a full extent of, of everything we can test. Um, and yeah, they're not they're not entirely correlated. Um, these graphs because they're they're somewhat independent. Um, we do do manual test runs outside of the merge request context. Um, sometimes you have core changes which are much more difficult and finicky, so they require a fair few uh, passes through the automated testing before they can be merged, just because no one can have, <laughs> you know, like. 30 different generations of, of GPU available to them on their desk. Um, you can also see uh, one particular spike, which was one of the least fun months of my life uh, when we had a lot of, of infrastructure issues on free desktop. Um, not really related to the test system, um, but more about things like networking, um, where the tests were, were so unreliable that we just had to keep running them over and over until they did. Um, they did eventually pass. Um, that one was was interesting. It, it definitely taught us some lessons about things like um, make sure you have not only really good monitoring for uh, false positives, but something that's quite um, dynamic and really easy to to modify. Uh, so you can pick those up and you don't push the burden back to uh, to developers to deal with themselves. Um, one of the things we found out is that <laughs> beyond a certain point of unreliability, uh, some developers will just smash retry every single time a test fails, even if it's failing because their code doesn't compile. Um, so there's definitely, you know, coming back to Guillaume's point about um, being iterative and, and building confidence, um, which kernel CI certainly does. There's a lot of sort of shadow testing in the background that that you don't see. Um, that's one thing we picked up from, from Mesa as well, is that it's really important to deliver the results as accurately as possible. So people not only get confidence in it, but they're also able to buy into it a bit more. So you know, testing becomes something that the whole community cares about rather than having developers and people who do test stuff, um, which is never a particularly nice dynamic to be in. So yeah, now we've talked about um, what we've been doing in our individual projects um, and a lot of the the challenges we've had there, how we've resolved them, you know, the ways that um, that we have brought testing to those projects. One really big thing um, that's coming up for us is, is bringing those all together um, and having them be more integrated and, and less siloed. Um, so for example, for all of our Mesa testing, uh, which we do on hardware, um, we pin a really specific kernel version. It's the only way to make Mesa testing tractable because otherwise, you know, we'd just be subject to a million things which are outside of our control. Um, but it's still really useful to have. I mean, kernel CI can test all of the kernel aspects, but it would be really useful for maintainers to know that, you know, their changes broke actual running user space workloads like Mesa or like GStreamer for, for media to code. Um, and being able to, to have that fast integrated feedback. And 
This is true everywhere. Conversely, Western pins a version of Mesa, and Kernel CI uh, pins known versions of, um, of user space components just to, to keep the whole stack tractable. Um, so one thing we've been looking at and working on is being able to, to share our workloads, our definitions, and the ways we parameterize them as well. Um, so we can bring in more integrated testing um, and be able to at least at least work on sort of fragments of, of the tests. So, you know, for example, we couldn't <laughs> we couldn't run the entire conformance test suites for every GPU, for every kernel revision, because there are just too many of them. But what we can do is run a smaller, more targeted subset and at least have a bit of confidence that um, things are roughly working as they should with, with new kernel versions. And that's something that helps us all. You know, it, um, it lets people know about regression sooner. Um, it makes sure that those regressions don't hit actual released kernels or Mesa versions or anything, but they're discovered before they um, can be found by users. So just cuts out that, that manual feedback loop. Um, and one thing we found with Mesa is having that testing um, even in Western with more limited testing there, it's let us move a lot more fearlessly. Um, we can be much less cautious about making sure that we don't break things. Um, there's a lot less manual testing, which takes up the developer's time, but you can do your code review and be sure that something else is going to pick up the more visible aspects of, of correctness. Um, and that that would be really great if you know the kernel would be able to move quicker without having to worry too much about Mesa and Mesa and Wayland didn't have to be terrified of upgrading the kernel because who knows what might break. Um, so that's something that that we're looking forward to having much more integration uh, with as time passes. And so if even if you're not participating in upstream open source projects, this is still meaningful to you. Um, because as we were saying at the beginning, you know, the, the upstream QA and CI has only really been meaningful um, to the upstream projects themselves, because there's often been such a distance between those projects and the vendors in terms of the time to deploy new versions, downstream customizations which get made, um, those often never find their way back to upstream because you know it's been so long and the code base has moved on anyway. Um, and this is a real problem when we think about not just things like Spectre and Meltdown, but the entire security landscape, um, you know, with such complex and rapidly moving software that you have to keep on top of it to ship something secure to people. So this is a huge benefit because the amount of testing that we do in the upstream projects these days gives so much more assurance that the vendors are able to pull in much newer versions of upstream software much more quickly than they have done in the past. Um, but this is obviously only possible if you have a much smaller delta of changes that you've made to existing upstream trees. So for the first time, there's a real incentive for, for vendors to work with upstream, both in terms of the changes they make and also in terms of helping us with the QA, the CI and the testing that we do. Because everything done to upstream means you can ship better software um, to your customers faster and it means that you can just have more and more assurance that what you're shipping is secure, it's validated, it's solid and it will do what you need it to do. So that's our quick summary of, um, of the landscape. We'll have some more details um, available in a blog on collabra.com. 
um, with a lot more details on how these upstream projects work, how to, to get involved and, and help out, especially with the testing angles. Um, but this is a thing that's here. We're not talking about the old days where open source was a, a kind of wild west fun project. Um, and, you know, it was the, the vendors who, who brought some kind of rigor um, to these projects. It's now something that over time, um, the open source projects have been able to embrace as part of their, their projects and their methodologies, and that's only going to, to increase. All of these efforts, they're, they're open to contributors. Kernel CI is a Linux Foundation project. Mesa CI is something primarily being worked on by Collabora, Google, Legalia, Red Hat, Valve, all companies who are just interested in the long-term health of Mesa. Similarly, Western, GStreamer, the testing infrastructure and development is shared between the entire community. And the more we do this, the more you can benefit from what we do upstream. So please come get involved. Um, don't be afraid, help us out and we can ship better software to you so you can ship better software to your customers. And with that, thank you very much. Um, we'll be here to, to take any questions you might have. And if you're interested in getting in touch, our email addresses as well are available in the title slide. So thank you. <laughs>